All right, we're going to talk quickly about diagnosing respiratory disease and starting out with looking at typical signs and symptoms of something that is dysfunctional in the respiratory system. So we can have things that we see and then we have symptoms that patients report. So first off, we have cough. So if you pay attention to yourself now, you probably aren't coughing. And the reason for that is a cough is a reflex to clear the lower respiratory passages, either because there's an inhaled irritant, there's too much mucus, um, something is physically obstructing airflow in some way. So if somebody coughs, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's an emergency. It could be that you swallowed some saliva the incorrect way. However, it is something that you'll see present when there's some sort of respiratory distress. Um, we refer to coughs as either productive or non-productive. Productive being coughs that bring up sputum. And we consider these advantageous coughs that we don't necessarily want to stop or inhibit because as the patient brings up more sputum, they're removing different bacteria or pathogens from the body. Um, whereas a non-productive or hacking cough is not productive, right? So there's nothing coming up as a result of that and it can end up causing a lot more damage than, um, than we would like it to. So those are the types of cough that usually we want to inhibit. The second thing here is dyspnea, which is Latin for air hunger. So dyspnea is how we describe shortness of breath. So the second individual here kind of looks like Clint Eastwood a little bit. So he's um, having some shortness of breath, maybe with exercise, he's wearing purple. Um, so he must be exercising. So shortness of breath, chest tightness, difficulty getting air in or out. Um, is definitely a sign of some sort of respiratory distress. Uh, that can become worse, and we can look at the action of the diaphragm when it becomes more pronounced, so we start to see more spasming of the diaphragm, uh, things we call retractions that um, help to initiate an inhale uh, to fix the respiratory distress the best that the body can. And then finally, we have cyanosis. We have this infant who is in the infant uh, protection program, uh, so we're not disclosing their identity, but they are exhibiting signs of cyanosis. So we see this bluish tint around the nose, around the mouth area, and that is telling us that there is a presence of deoxygenated hemoglobin. So rather than having this scarlet red type of hue, we see this bluish hue which uh, is not normal. That's a sign of respiratory signs or symptoms of distress. Um, this can either be peripheral in nature, meaning some sort of vasoconstriction is limiting the blood flow, causing symptoms of cyanosis, or it can be central, meaning that the actual blood oxygenation as a result of movement of gases across the respiratory barrier is altered in some way. And we refer to that as the ventilation perfusion ratio or VQ ratio, which I'll go over in just a second. When I said second, I wasn't lying. So right now we've got the ventilation perfusion ratio. Q is how we define flow. So ventilation is air in and out. So that's your act of breathing where Q is flow. So that is referencing the blood flow, which if we think about the way blood is coming in, if this right here, this is our alveolus, one single one, and around an alveolus is a capillary, capillary bed, we have blood that's coming up from the system. And generally it should be carrying some CO2 that has been, you know, generated due to oxygen being utilized by different cellular mechanisms in the body. That CO2 should travel via the bloodstream, enter the alveolus. Because things flow from high to low concentration, there should be low CO2 in the alveolus, so it should passively move over the respiratory barrier which is the alveolar membrane and then the capillary wall. 
So the CO2 moves from blood to the alveolus and then is exhaled. And that is exchanged then for oxygen that comes in from the atmosphere into the lungs and the alveolus. And at first, the oxygen is very high in the alveolus. And at this point in time, we have low oxygen in the bloodstream because it was previously carrying our CO2. So the oxygen is going to hopefully traverse this respiratory membrane very easily. So going over the alveolar wall, the type 1 cell, um, alveolar cell, and then the capillary wall and the basement membrane that separates them. We'll pretend this green is our basement membrane. So capillary wall, basement membrane, type 1 alveolar cell. So what we have, this ventilation is a measure then of the oxygen. So the air that's being brought in and the Q is the flow of the blood, which is giving us a, a measure for CO2 essentially. So if all is well, if we visualize these things as actual numbers, so, so if we give these oxygen CO2 amounts of value assigned to it. Let's assign an imaginary value to the liters of oxygen in CO2 out by plugging them into our VQ ratio. So let's say ventilation again, that's looking at O2 and let's make up a, an amount for that. Let's say that we measured it as a 10. So we would say ventilation is at 10 liters or milliliters, whatever, we're using a 10. So our O2 is at about 10, and the CO2 that we're measuring to tell us our flow is also a 10. So 10 liters to 10 liters, 10 over 10 equals one. That's some pretty easy math. And what that is telling you is that oxygen in is completely matched to CO2 out, which gives you a VQ ratio of one. Perfectly matched, that's a perfect system, everything is going great when these two numbers are the same. So a well-matched, healthy system, we should have a VQ ratio of about one. However, we can also have altered VQ ratios and it's just simple math, so buckle in for a second. So a general rule of thumb is that if a VQ ratio is elevated to something over one, then it's generally a heart problem. And why we can determine that is, again, by looking at this VQ ratio and plugging some numbers in. You might have actual values or we could, you know, just use our imagination like right now. So let's say if ventilation, so air in and out is still going to be normal like we had in our past example. So we still have our number 10 for the oxygen. However, our flow, because there is something wrong, so like in this picture, we see that there's smaller capillaries, there's smaller flow for whatever reason. So let's say that it's about half that it has been reduced by. So instead of being 10, it's now at five plug it into VQ, 10 over five equals two. So you see that we have the greater number, which is V. So we have a normal oxygen, but a reduced CO2. Because of that math, we get a number greater than one. That is going to be different than, than if you have, let me erase this, if we have a VQ ratio less than one. Your rule of thumb for this is a VQ ratio less than one is telling you that there's something wrong with the lungs. So if we look at this picture, we see that airflow or oxygen flow into the alveolus is reduced where we have normal flow, normal CO2. So again, let's plug this into our VQ ratio and use some numbers similar to what we did before. So here our flow is normal. So let's make it that original 10 number. But in this example, we see that the airflow has been reduced. So our V, our 
our ventilation, our oxygen is going to be reduced by half. So now when we plug these numbers into the VQ ratio, we have five over 10. That math's a little trickier, but I think you can do it. Five over 10 is 0 0.5. 0 0.5 is less than one. So a VQ ratio less than one is indicative of a lung issue because ventilation or oxygen is reduced where the flow, the CO2 is constant. So general rules of thumb, we should have one to one VQ ratio. If it's greater than one, it's a heart problem. If it's less than one, it's a lung problem. All right. All right. Some other things that let you know that there is something respiratory going on are looking at pulmonary volumes, which you can use pulmonary function tests to look at. So some volumes you should be familiar with. What you're looking at here is volume here on the y-axis, so milliliters per kilogram. And this would be when somebody is hooked up to a spirometer and they're asked to breathe in and out. And the first little wave you see here, this is our tidal volume, TV, tidal volume. Even though the lungs in a male, they can hold about six liters of air, so about six liters can fit in here. For a female, it's on average about five liters of air. Even though a ton of air can fit in the lungs, generally when we're breathing in and out, we're just taking little sips of air. And that air that's typically used in normal breathing, normal quiet breathing, not forced ventilation because of exercise. In and out, quiet breathing, our tidal volume, it's about 0.5 liters of air. 0.5 liters of air, air in and out. So that's your tidal volume. So that's what you're seeing here. Then we can get some other definitions from this. So if we ask the patient at the end of their next exhale, to breathe all the way in and fill up their lungs the best that we can. If we measure here from the top of what would be their normal tidal volume inhale and look at how much air can fit into the lungs on top of that, we get our next measure, which is called the inspiratory reserve volume. How much extra air can fit into the lungs? And on average, it's about 2.5 liters. Because the lungs are high in elastin, they can stretch quite a bit and they can fit in quite a bit of air. So about two and a half liters of air is available for inspiratory reserve, extra air space that can be inhaled. All right. If you instead ask the patient to exhale from normal tidal volume. So at the bottom of normal tidal volume, you ask them to exhale all the air that they could. We would get the expiratory reserve volume, meaning outside of normal tidal volume, how much air can you then force out, the ERV? And that is about one to one and a half liters of air uh, that can be removed. And I want you to notice that that's different, right? So we can fit in in this reserve about two and a half liters where we can only exhale about one to one and a half liters of air. So that's a big difference. So why is that? Well, that is because there should be some amount of air left in the lungs at any given point in time so that the lungs do not collapse. And that is also the, a similar number to expiratory reserve, about one to one and a half liters of air. One and a half is a little bit more on the average side. That's called the residual volume. It's residual, it's always in there. If it's not in there, then the lungs are in danger of collapsing. 
if you've ever had the wind knocked out of you, uh, you've lost some of your residual volume. And you'll notice you, you feel like you're going to die. The diaphragm spasms uncontrollably because it functions to fill the lungs back up to its residual volume so that they can go on working normally with just the diaphragm moving down for inhale and then the elastic recoil of the chest wall working for the exhale. All right, some other things I want you to know. We've got our vital capacity. So vitale is Latin for life. So that's essentially all the air that you can blow out without without dying, without the lungs collapsing. So that would be starting at the very top of an inhale. So asking a patient to inhale everything they can, fill the lungs as tight as possible, and then exhale, woo, my picture's moving all the way out. That is the vital capacity. So the vital capacity is essentially the total lung capacity, which we already said in a male is about six liters, females about five liters. It would be the total capacity minus the residual volume because you always need that one and a half liters of air in the lungs. So full inspiratory reserve plus expiratory reserve, the little space for the tidal volume, everything from full inhale to the bottom of the full exhale. So that should be about four and a half to five, whoops, over here, four and a half to five liters of air, depending on the residual volume. All right, so those are some measures that you can use to look at things. Then let's put that into practice by looking at these spirometry tests. So looking at that expiratory reserve, a really simple test is forced expiratory volume, and that's abbreviated as FEV, and there's a one here at the end because that is for amount of seconds that you're measuring the airflow in. So you can see FEV1, FEV5, but essentially you ask the patient to breathe in and then exhale as hard as they can, like they're blowing out a birthday candle, and you measure the amount of air that is removed in that first second, that one second, or if it's FEV5, it'd be in the first five seconds of this forced exhalation, like blowing out a candle. There's also the simple vital capacity test. And that is, again, the total amount of air that that patient can breathe out from full inhale all the way down to the exhale, the bottom of the exhale. So you get this nice curve, which tells you how much air is um, actually breathed out, so the exhaled volume of the air, and you'll also get a length. So that's really important because in things like constrictive lung diseases, it takes a long time for air to be removed, whereas with hyperelastic diseases like emphysema, the air is removed very quickly. So those are really simple, non-invasive tasks. The spirometer is just this little measurement tool drum that's filled with air we can use water there's other uh, negative gravity devices which can be used as well but basically it's just looking at air that's exhaled all right then we can look at the actual respiratory membrane that i mentioned before so remember we've got the alveolus we've got a capillary over here and so we're looking at this membrane, which is essentially the alveolus wall, the alveolar wall, the capillary wall. And then between that, we have that basement membrane. And gases should excuse, or excuse, should diffuse really, really easily over this very thin membrane. CO2 and O2 can be exchanged very easily. It's very thin, very high compliance, low resistance. So we shouldn't have any difficulty with that. However, if there is any kind of problem in gas exchange, we can measure that with a diffusing capacity test. So if you remember, there is one thing, if we look at hemoglobin, there's one thing that hemoglobin loves to bind, and it's definitely not oxygen. It will bind oxygen, but if it has the choice, 
it'll bind carbon monoxide. Its affinity or attraction to carbon monoxide is about 150 times higher than it is for oxygen. So what that means is if there is any oxygen bound to the hemoglobin, it'll be dislodged so that the carbon monoxide can bind to it. So if this dude, he's very relaxed here, he's got a mask on and he's attached to a tank and there should be a little bit of carbon monoxide dissolved in tracer gas in this tank. Because of the high affinity for uh, carbon monoxide to hemoglobin, if a healthy person with a healthy respiratory membrane inhales carbon monoxide in any amount and we measure their exhale, for carbon monoxide. There shouldn't be any in there, right? Because the body loves it. So there should be none. However, if we see that there is CO2 in the exhale, then something is wrong with the ability of gases to diffuse over the membrane. So this tells you an actual measure of the binding capability of the hemoglobin, and it gives you a nice piece to the story. And it kind of looks like in this picture, a fun little car that you can drive, but uh, it gives you, again, the it literally is named for what it is. So the diffusing capacity of gases, because as we'll see in intrinsic restrictions, we have the scarring and then the thickening of these respiratory membranes. And that is going to alter the ability of gases to diffuse over them. All right, an easy, easy test is arterial blood gas. I say that as a non-clinician who does not have to sample blood from anybody, but arterial blood gas is a blood sample. Here we have the right radial artery that's being sampled from. So we take a little, when we say we, I mean you, not me. So we take a blood sample and you can measure oxygen, CO2, and pH. And pH is important because CO2 is an acid. So if we see a pH that's altered, that is that can tell us a lot about CO2 and oxygen levels. So this gives us the ability to look at VQ alterations by putting actual numbers along with CO2 and O2 so that we can look at the VQ ratio. We can look at ventilation. We can look at all kinds of things that way just by sampling the blood. And then finally, the least invasive test is the pulse ox, the pulse ox meter. Pulse oximeter, I love to not say that word actually, but basically this is a fun little device that can be put onto the fingertip, onto an earlobe, onto the foot of a newborn, and it gives you the saturation level of oxygen at the level, again, of the hemoglobin, and it does so by bouncing these light particles, these photons back and forth that uh, would go through the blood supply in the finger or the earlobe or whatever, and looks at the absorbance then of the arterial blood to tell you the saturation of oxygen there. You don't have to understand the physics to know that we get this nice readout in real time of oxygen saturation. And that, my friends, is diagnostic criteria and tools and values for respiratory disorders.